You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Friday the 25th of November. I lost my job because I wasn't a Muslim. Teachers could face the sack for refusing to promote gay marriage. The Beast of Tunbridge Wells. Slippery Labour MPs in Liverpool. Controversial Saudi cleric to appear in Swiss Islamic Council. Report from Nick Griffin, MEP. Pak Iran pipeline on schedule. A hurricane of global warming lies. Return home, Greek police say goodbye to non-EU foreigners in 13 languages. Turkey tightens its defences. Thought for the day, who'd have thought it? And finally, sex with the dead and a skeleton, please. UK News. Kuwaiti Bank made British boss redundant from six-figure salary job because of his religious beliefs. A British banker claims he lost his £185,000 a year job with a Kuwaiti-owned investment bank because he wasn't a Muslim. James Bagshaw, 53, was the chief operating officer of the Gatehouse Bank when he was suddenly made redundant while on holiday in August 2011. He claims he was replaced by the less experienced Twala Dunno, who was a Muslim. Mr Bagshaw from Gravesend, Kent, who was a founding member of the bank, said, I feel that I have been badly treated by Gatehouse and its board. Liz Trust, an education minister, refused to rule out the possibility that teachers, even in faith schools, could face disciplinary action for objecting on grounds of conscience. Parents who object to gay marriage being taught to their children would also have no right to withdraw their child from lessons. A World Date reporter stated, Thus, we have a true fascist state now in the UK. A terrified walker claims eight-foot-tall creature with demonic red eyes and long arms roared at him in historic town's woods. In a leafy Kent town, albeit an historic and quaint Middle England town, which doesn't really like creating a scene, if the reports of one terrified walker are to be believed, the residents of Royal Tunbridge Wells could have a giant Bigfoot-like creature in their midst. A man walking in the woods besides the town's common claims to have spotted an eight-foot-tall beast which, according to the sun, looked like America's legendary Bigfoot, roared at the walker, who immediately ran off in fear, as anyone would. Bless him, perhaps he doesn't like Kent. Luciana Berger, Labour Party MP for Liverpool Wavertree Ward, has asked the details of her landlord be kept secret. The Labour MP, who is reported to be friends with Tony Blair's son Ewan, has claimed more than £24,000 in rent for her London flat. Her flat, owned by a British Virgin Islands company, rents for about £1,560 per month. Also in the news was Berger's past associate on the parliamentary group Labour Friends of Israel, Labour MP for Liverpool Riverside Ward, Louise Elman. Elman was one of Labour's leading anti-drugs campaigners until her son, Sean Alex Elman, one of the biggest dealers in the legal high Gogaine, not cocaine drug, was arrested during a raid on one of his string of head shops. The raid was initiated after a 17-year-old student was rushed to hospital after using Gogaine. District Judge Nicholas Sanders sent the case to Magistrates Court after refusing prosecution arguments for it to be heard in Crown Court. Now the most Sean Alex Elman can receive is a fine rather than a custodial sentence. The case is scheduled to be heard later this month, but don't hold your breath, he never turned up at his first hearing as he was on holiday. I now hand you over to Nick Griffin, MEP, for his report from the belly of the beast. Good news for sharks, more Euro arrogance, and an expose of how the political elite are still trying to hide the real facts of the paedophile grooming scandal from the public. These are the main subjects I'm setting out for you this week as I return from the belly of the EU beast in Strasbourg. Among the reports we had to vote on this week was a rare creature one that I could support in the final electronic vote on the whole thing. This was the report on the utterly barbaric practice known as shark finning. This involves catching sharks, hauling them on deck, hacking off their fins, and throwing the mutilated creatures back into the sea alive, 
to die long, lingering, agonized deaths from a combination of injury and starvation. The growth of a massive middle class in China has driven the demand for shark fins through the roof, with the result that many shark species are now in real danger of extinction. If ever there was a case for a global response to a problem, it's surely this one. Personally, I'd be quite happy to support a World Shark Protection Police, empowered to board any fishing boat anywhere on the seven seas, and, if they found so much as a single shark fin without a shark corpse to match, to hack the hands off the skipper and throw him overboard. That'd stop it. But as that's not on the cards, and as good causes are always used as the thin end of the undemocratic global governance wedge, I have to settle for having voted to end shark finning and for imploring you, yes you, to pledge right now never, ever, ever to eat shark fin soup and to walk out in disgust from any establishment that even serves it. That said, I have to confess that I did have a bowl of shark fin soup in 1982. In mitigation, I can only plead that at the time I had no idea of the horror involved and it was the only thing in the Chinese restaurant to which I've been taken by my Swedish hosts that I could face while suffering from what remains the second worst hangover of my life, a combination for connoisseurs of such self-inflicted woes of beer, vodka, homemade apple schnapps, and a sauna. But now I know how they get the fins, it's not a sin I will ever repeat, and I hope that I've finally atoned for it this week with my votes to resist the attempts by the Portuguese to put loopholes into the report that would allow finning to continue. Having done that, it was back to the usual business of voting for every amendment that would weaken any bit of the ongoing avalanche of EU regulation, against every amendment that would make the proposals any worse, and then against the whole report. Two classics this week were the Kappa and Dangin reports. The first is a mishmash of plans to enlarge the EU, increase its powers, and unadulterated PC insanity. The second is a grotesquely arrogant call for a common defence policy. Despite the continuing chaos engulfing Greece and Spain, and increasingly threatening France with fiscal disaster, both reports were passed by massive majorities. If anything, the more the Europhiles see their toxic dream failing at the financial and economic level, the more frantic they are becoming to promote their Federalist agenda in other areas. In due course, all these efforts will turn out to be as misconceived and counterproductive as the single currency is already, and the result will be even more hostility between the various peoples and nations of Europe. It's such a terrible shame, because left in charge of our own affairs, with government closer to the people, the free nations with which we share so much common culture would get on so much better. This week, I stayed a few miles out of the busy and expensive city of Strasbourg, in the quaint old wall town of Obenai. If ever you're passing through Alsace, do try to make the time to visit this gem that looks German, but is determinedly French. Amble through its little streets of absurdly picturesque half-timbered buildings, inside the walls that protected generations of craftsmen and merchants. Almost miraculously spared by three wars between France and Germany, Obenai gives a glimpse of what was lost in the two in which Britain, America, Russia, and just about everyone else except for the sensible French, were also involved. If you could go back and see the streets in the medieval centre of Coventry on the evening of the 14th of November, 1940, you would find them far more akin to Obenai than to the ghastly inhuman jumble of Marxoid concrete boxes that rose from the charred embers of that terrible night. Rotterdam, Plymouth, Caen, Exeter, Mannheim, Leicester, Warsaw, Derby, Lubeck, Kiev, Dresden, and thousands of other cities and towns from Belfast and Liverpool right across Europe into Russia all suffered devastation that turned Obenai from a commonplace into an all-too-rare survivor. So it's no wonder that the founders of the EU were obsessed with the need to avoid any more European wars. The shame is that such understandable and worthy an aim is leading to disaster of a different kind, the destruction not of bricks and mortar, but of entire societies. Some of the conspirators behind the Federal Europe project have been thoroughly wicked, but for many it's been more of a case of the road to hell being paved with good intentions. The evil good men do. Happily, Open Eye is still there, looking as lovely as ever this week with its Christmas decorations going up. As I took a chilly late evening stroll along its ramparts the other day, I considered myself very privileged to be able to do so. If you were one of those whose hard work and donations helped to make me an MEP, thank you. I'll close on a matter of unfinished business. Do take a look at the article by the good Dr. Phil Edwards on the BNP website yesterday. Having a scientific doctorate, he's done magical things. Well, to me, that is 
as I only scraped a math low level thanks to the terror inspired by Mr. Gregson and his ruler and flying board rubber. Magical things to unlock the truth concealed behind the bare facts about the paedophile gangs examined in the whitewash report by the Deputy Children's Commissioner. His revelation that a proper analysis of the figures shows that Pakistani males are 28 times more likely to be child abusers than indigenous men should, of course, make headlines in every newspaper in the country. But, as we know, it won't. And, as a matter of fact, even Dr. Edwards' calculation gives a picture that doesn't show the true guilt that the many decent people in the Muslim community need to take steps to condemn and rectify. Because the figures quoted in the report of convicted groomers show 545 whites, 415 Asians, mostly Pakistanis, 244 blacks, and 310 undisclosed. Never mind asking how many of the blacks are Somalis and other Muslims. What on earth do they mean by undisclosed? Not Brits, that's for sure. But how many of the undisclosed would be Muslims? Think about Albanians, who dominate sex slave trafficking all over Europe. Or consider the two men accused of the grooming, rape and murder of Charlene Downs. Being Lebanese, if they were retried, and the police have said they're not looking for anyone else in connection with Charlene's disappearance, would they be classed as white or Asian or black or undisclosed? You see what I mean? As a matter of fact, in their case, it could well be even worse because the Office of National Statistics, which uses the same ethnic classification system as the police, who supply all the data about such things to the Crown Prosecution Service, classify Turks as white. Now, some Turks, particularly upper-class ones on the western side of Turkey, are white in the eyes of any normal person. I've counted several as friends. But the sort of Turk who works in the seedy kebab shops that are so often a base of operations for grooming and child abuse is most definitely not white. But the police say they are. So those 545 whites include every Turk who's ever been caught noncing little English girls. I'm still trying to find out how the authorities classify Albanians and Kurds and Iraqis and Iranians and Lebanese, like the two accused of Charlene. But since those 545 whites include Turks, I think we already know the answer. Which means that, even in the report that is supposed to form the bedrock of a new drive by the authorities to deal with the grooming crisis, we're still being deceived, still being lied to, still being treated like mushrooms, kept in the dark and fed the most poisonous bullshit imaginable. Of course, there are genuinely white British paedophiles, and they should be chemically castrated alongside Abdul and Azif. But in order to fight the overall problem, we must know the real picture. And as you now know even better than before, it's still being hidden from us. And the full price for this deceit will be paid by innocent children. Which is why we're here. Because someone has to stop all this. And if it's not us, there's no one else who will. So, until next Friday, keep off the shark fin soup, keep off the kebabs, and keep the faith. Thank you, Nick, for bringing our attention to the shark's fin soup especially. Disgusting and unnecessary. Perhaps it would be better if the newly rich Chinese made a speciality out of eating the existing poor Chinese, thus reducing their vast numbers. A controversial Saudi preacher has been authorised to appear at the second annual conference of the Central Islamic Swiss Council in Freiburg next month over the objections of critics. The planned appearance of Sheikh Mohammed al Arifi at the December 15th meeting has raised concerns because of the inflammatory statements he has broadcast on YouTube and elsewhere. The Sheikh is alleged by critics to have made anti Semitic remarks, insulted homosexuals and the Danish people, and offered advice on wife beating. He is also known for declaring in a television interview that in a Muslim religion there is no minimum age for the marriage of a young girl according to a spokesperson for the Bern-based Swiss Association of Former Muslims. Qasem al-Ghazali, the association's president, told Limata he believes in the freedom of expression, but al-Arifi is a Salafist who preaches violence and hatred. The association and the Zurich-based Forum for Democracy and Human Rights both issued a statement condemning the Sheik's planned appearance at the Freiburg meeting. The group cited a case in which al-Arifi said on a programme on the Al Risala channel in Saudi Arabia, financed by religious authorities, that Western women married dogs and donkeys, 
and that 54% of Danish women did not know who the fathers of their children were. We condemn racist and sexist declarations that violate the Swiss legal system, the group said. Greek police will distribute one and a half million leaflets translated into 13 languages and dialects to foreigners from third world countries and inform them about a programme to return home. The programme was designed by Athens Aliens Directorate in cooperation with the Press Office of Ministry for Public Order and Citizen Protection in order to increase the returns of non-EU foreigners back to home without incurring cost. The leaflet has been translated into English, French, Spanish, Albanian, Russian, Chinese, Arabic, Bengali, Kurdish, Farsi, Urdu, Pashto and Dari and the cost of the project is mainly covered by the European Return Home Fund. Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad has claimed that his country's gas export to Pakistan is on schedule. The Iranian president said today that the gas pipeline to Pakistan will be completed by 2014. Meanwhile, the Israeli newspapers have announced that large amounts of what they call dirt or soil is being carried off to a military site where the nuclear watchdog International Atomic Energy Agency and the UN want to inspect. If the Americans do not wake up, they will fall victim to a vast matrix of environmental organisations, government agencies and the mainstream media. At his recent press conference, President Obama, in response to a question, said, You know, as you know, Mark, we can't attribute any particular weather event to climate change. What we do know is the temperature around the globe is increasing faster than it was predicted 11 years ago. That is a flat-out lie. The temperature of the Earth has been cooling for at least 16 years. The devastation that Hurricane Sandy wrought defies the imagination, particularly for those on the East Coast, where so much destruction was inflicted. It mirrored 2005's Hurricane Katrina, and it's only natural for people to believe there has been an increase in hurricanes striking the US homeland, but there hasn't. Turkey has asked NATO for permission to deploy Patriot missile defence along the Syrian border. The Turkish-Syrian border has been a hotspot for activity over the past few months. The Turks claim the area is not defended well enough. The Syrian government condemns the request as provocative. Thought for the day. Who'd have thought it? So who would have thought that one day in this country a red-top newspaper would have the nerve to question the reasons behind the excellent YBNP leaflet on anti-Muslim grooming that went out and the qualifications of certain party personnel manning the pumps behind other organisations mentioned on said leaflets. I can say with truth that all of us are mothers and fathers. We are not, thank God, so-called qualified social workers who are paid to turn a blind eye to underage sexual abuse or put very young children into care, which means they're more open to sexual predators. We are not targeting youngsters for sexual favours or pimping out. We are simply drawing attention to the plight of these poor little girls and giving them contact facilities if needed from which they can be passed to proper organisations that can or rather should be able to help. We can get details of which police are involved and crime reference numbers. We are not the baddies here. Why doesn't this paper tackle the Muslim perverts and paedophiles inside their own territory? Who'd have thought it? Who'd have thought it in an excellent article in the Daily Mail has brought to light the plight of the NHS in the form of an Indian radiographer, Ramani Ramaswani, who was dismissed from the Christie Cancer Hospital in Manchester after six years of lack of competency in a number of areas whilst working at the Christie Hospital, Manchester. Who thought that an Indian who spoke little or no English managed to get a job in the first place? No doubt handed to him on a plate from another of his own kind already in situ. His photograph, taken at his front door, show a man with a woman behind him, and I doubt if they speak English behind their closed doors. Because, face up to it, why did he have to, when he could fool everyone for some years? Romani Ramaswani should be deported, along with his family, as he will not be working in the UK. God knows how many lives he's put in danger. The Christie should have an inquiry, but they won't. Who'd have thought it? There is another side to this coin, though. This week, in a visit to a Surrey hospital, my husband had to see a radiographer. He was third-generation West Indian, highly educated, and spoke better English than my American husband, and he was charming. 
Now on the minus side, I have to arrange some finances with the hospital every time we travel up with two offices in that place. I went to the first one, no change in personnel, very nice middle-aged white ladies. Then I had to go down to the actual money office, usually staffed by, yup, nice middle-aged white ladies, only to find myself face to face with a green-eyed yellow idol from Kathmandu, the Philippines or Thailand or somewhere of that ilk. She was brusque, unsmiling and practically threw the small amount of petrol money at me. If I have to meet her again, I'll ask her if she doesn't like her job to give it to someone who can smile and talk a little or just perhaps leave the country. Who'd have thought we are replacing nice people with highly unpleasant ones in an area which needs the occasional smile and laugh? Oh, the joys of enrichment. Who'd have thought that the Daily Mail would publish last Saturday an article on the fact that the inquiry into sex gangs downplays the race factor? Well, they're all doing it. It only isn't the race factor, it is a religious factor. They're still bleating on about Asians and ignoring the fact that it has been ignored for 30 years. It is not simply Asians, it is Muslims, and this includes Eastern European Muslims. Even Anne Cryer has deserted her post as chief whistleblower in her latest statements on sexual abuse being from all ethnic backgrounds and even blaming the Pakistani arranged marriage system. It is not a purely Pakistani system. It is, however, mainly a Muslim system. And you can be a Muslim whatever ethnicity you are. Her argument of arranged marriages and forcing young Pakistani men to wander is weak and taken from the statement of Shakil Aziz who runs some sort of organisation for young hefty Muslim men who'd have thought it. Aziz bleated the same words at the Coalition for the Removal of Pimping this time last year in Liverpool. Now, I may not be that bright, but I'd have thought a young man, if unhappy in his arranged marriage, would be unlikely to target very young girls of different religion and then, after raping them, put them out to work for him and his friends. It doesn't read like Mills and Boone, does it? These men are not unhappy in their marriages. They are good Muslims and they act just like the Koran tells them to in regard to unbelievers or kafirs. Take them in and make money out of them. When they're either dead or useless, pass on and get more. That is the Islamic creed, and anyone telling themselves, as Cryer does, that these Muslims are behaving in an un-Islamic fashion are kidding themselves. They are behaving in a truly Islamic fashion towards a race or races they consider beneath contempt. Who'd have thought it, Anne? Wake up and stop jumping on the Muslim bandwagon. It left long ago. As a renowned Muslim cleric has stated openly, in the Muslim religion there is no minimum age for the marriage of a young girl, and the same applies even more so if that girl is non-Muslim and vulnerable. It is all systems go. Who'd have thought the British National Party would succeed where so-called angels fear to tread? And finally, Saudi Arabia. A 33-year-old Bangladeshi morgue worker has been accused of raping a dead woman and denied he committed the crime, saying he only wanted to see the corpse's genitals. A Saudi employee at a government hospital caught the Bangladeshi with the naked dead woman inside the morgue last week and told the hospital management that the worker was raping the corpse. The worker told police he did not rape the corpse, but he took the sheets off her and caressed the body out of curiosity, because the devil made him do it. We also had the story from Sweden of the woman accused of having sex with a skeleton. Yes, with a skeleton. It reads thus, Woman charged for sex with human skeleton. A woman in western Sweden who was arrested after police found skeletons in her apartment has now been charged for using the bones as sex toys, a hobby she claimed was motivated by an interest in history. Oh. This presenter says it's hardly Fifty Shades of Grey, is it? What was that joke about two skeletons having sex on a tin roof? The noisiest thing in the world? Don't forget to get your bums off seats to vote on November the 29th in Rotherham for our Marlene guest, a true fighter of causes. There is also a day of action this Saturday in Rotherham, details of which are on the party websites. Remember, if you do not vote, you cannot complain. It only takes one vote to make a difference and make it your vote. You have been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozart and I and the team at World at Eight and Radio Britain wish you all a very safe and productive weekend. <laughs>